Uh, my name is Joe Evinger, uh, and I'm co-host along with Hillary of the Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group. We meet every Tuesday. I, I'm sorry, the second Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> the second Wednesday of uh, every month. And this month's speaker is very special because he's a co-founder of the science and ideas group. I believe uh, it was founded something like 2017, Roger. You know, short-term memory is not my strong suit. I mostly <laughs> deal in the, in the uh, Paleolithic. Paleolithic, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, so Roger is a retired uh, anthropology and history instructor, and most recently at Berkeley City College, founding member of our science group. As I said, he's taught all the major subfields of anthropology, human uh, evolution, archaeology, linguistics, and human cultural variations. And with that, I can see no reason to blather on about a founder of the group. <laughs> Roger, take it over. Okay. Hillary, do you have anything you want to say before I start? Hillary, you're, you're muted. I uh, remind people that the event is recorded and will be on the Ashby Village YouTube channel. Only the speaker's image is in the recording, so if you do not speak, you will not appear in it. But if you want to speak and not have your image, you should turn off your video. And if you don't want to be identified, rename yourself or remove your name. Thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm um, glad to be back. Um, the previous one uh, in this series, and I hope it's going to be an ongoing series, uh, was about a year ago, and it was called Out of Africa, um, and it had to do with uh, early human migrations to Australia and New Zealand, which, or excuse me, and, and New Guinea, which um, was, a, you know, I thought very interesting topic, and as uh, Joe mentioned, um, somehow or other, it uh, found a following on, on the internet and it's now had uh, 3,700 hits, which is a totally surprising. I'm not sure why, um, but uh, anyway, there it is. And I think that it, I think a good explanation would be that people are interested in their ancestry and where did we come from and that sort of thing. There's a lot of interest in that. So. You know, this is kind of the early part, you know, if you want to know where you came from, you know, I'm going to go back to the very beginnings of our species and, um, and then the migrations around the world, which I think is a fascinating story. I'm not going to get into anything historical, you know, uh, anthropologists, once they meet the written word, they retreat, you know, and they say, oh, no, no, that's the historians. Uh, but not only that, but it's a different topic really and you know maybe we'll have a historian come and do that but um anyway what i'll do is uh go ahead and uh start sharing my screen i guess i can do that right hillary let's try that and um let's preview okay here we are Okay, so this is my first screen out of Africa, uh, migrations from Africa to East Asia and the Pacific. That's our topic for today. And uh, this is kind of our title screen. Um, I just wanted to just pause on this a short minute. Um, you know, I think it's very evocative. It looks like um, old uh, population migrating in the, uh, perhaps in the, um, grasslands of Central Asia, you know, it's hard to say where, but they are wearing um, quite a bit of clothing. So I don't think it's in the savanna of, of Africa, but uh, on the clothing, uh, this is very good clothing. This is um, some tailored clothing, which is a mark of our species. Um, earlier species, if they used clothing that was just sort of a, a robe of a, a fur of an animal, perhaps, and plus they have a cradle board here and so on. So these are pretty, by anthropological standards, pretty, pretty advanced, you know, and then they have these uh, spears with hafted uh, blades, uh, nice uh, spear points. So um, we're not gonna get into a lot of um, material culture in this presentation. I probably will do that 
in another one. But um, for this one, I really want to focus on uh, uh, fossils and genes. So um, how do we know about the events that happened so long ago? That's a, one of our questions. We'll try to get into that. And how can we learn from ancient fossils? Uh, in particular, uh, the ne Neanderthals, who are um, our close relatives. And um, a lot has been found out about them recently. And I wanted to go into um, some of the details there. Uh, and then uh, research in genetics. Um, you're, um, you're all aware of you know, what a wonderful um, development has happened in genetics. We have the human genome and so on. Um, all kinds of implications and you know, we're not gonna cover all genetics by any sense, but uh, we have this mysterious population of our uh, ancient relatives and they have the name of uh, Denisovans or Denisovans. I'm probably gonna call them Denisovans. It works better in English that way. It's actually a Russian word, so it should be Denisovans, but who cares? Um, and then this question about languages, I'm not gonna to do too much on languages here. I, you know, I got into this and I realized, you know, let's save that one for another presentation. Um, I'll probably use the language stuff uh, when we talk about uh, migrations into Europe, uh, where it's very interesting about the history of um, the Indo-European languages and stuff like that. So we won't really touch on that very much. And then at the end, uh, hopefully we get to the Polynesian people because this is a wonderful story of how they um, sailed out to all the habitable islands, the Pacific Ocean, uh, truly amazing uh, set of discoveries. Um, but for now, we're looking at Asia. And uh, this map is kind of a, a conceptual map that I think when we think of different parts of Asia, uh, we have this idea that there's these east, west, and stuff like that. So uh, the part we're going to be talking about is this blue part, which is, uh, includes Japan, uh, which we call East Asia. Um, the part that's in this pale green, we think of as Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia has uh, what we call peninsular Southeast Asia, which is attached to the mainland currently. And then we have um, island Southeast Asia. So. Um, We'll be getting to that probably towards the end. Uh, South Asia, uh, that includes India, Pakistan, um, to, um, Tibet and Nepal and not Tibet, excuse me, to, uh, Nepal and um, Bangladesh. And then um, Central Asia, which is a place that's getting a lot of press lately because it, it includes Afghanistan here. But if you read some of the stories, you'll, you'll read that some of the people uh, of Afghanistan are of Tajik uh, ethnicity. This is Tajikistan. And these are the other stands that uh, we've talked about before. And then, uh, of course, the uh, Arabian part um, or Middle East, you know, that word Middle East is kind of, you know, where does it start and end and so on. But notice that the Russian part, you know, goes all the way across the top. I mean, this is a very, very big country. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, ancient ancestors who, uh, who, who founded lineages that, that eventually migrated to the Americas. Uh, so the Eastern part of Asia is connected that way. And we do find some um, DNA in individuals uh, in China that, that show up uh, in some of those tribes that come across. But if we look at the, at the physical geography of Asia, um, this is sort of a satellite view. And uh, first of all, it's really the mother continent. And, and, and second, it's, you know, is Europe really a second continent? Well, you know, they, they use the Urals and, uh, and the Caucasus Mountains in here to uh, divide uh, Europe from Asia, but it's, it's pretty much a continuous landmass without with relatively uh, low barriers to uh, to uh, to migration. So a lot of times we talk about Eurasia just to talk about the whole thing. So probably the biggest influence geographically in uh, Eurasia is the Himalayan uh, massif, which is this, the biggest, the highest mountains in the world, as you know. 
uh, formed when the uh, plate coming in from the south bumped up against the, the uh, mainland and pushed up and they're still being pushed up. So these mountains are, you know, 29,000 feet or so at the highest. And, um, but it, it forms a major barrier. Uh, so it's a barrier for um, animals to come uh, going uh, west to east uh, or north to south. It's, it's a major uh, uh, block here. But the other thing about it is that uh, when it heats up in the spring, uh, all that hot air rising off of this mountain uh, draws uh, ocean air in from the south and brings the monsoon. So the, the monsoons come into India and into Southeast Asia um, in, the, in the early summer, usually starting in uh, late May, early June or so. It depends on the location, of course. Uh, but they, the, all that moisture falls uh, at the front, the leading edge of the Himalayas, and some of it gets up into the mountains, and only a very little gets across. So it's similar to our Sierra Nevada uh, in that uh, there's a rain shadow. So the rain shadow here in the north um, blocks the moisture, so you've got the, the deserts here, the Gobi Desert and the Taklamakan Desert and so on, that are on the uh, northern side. Um, but I would mention also the uh, Altai Mountains, which are here in western Mongolia, um, it's a gets uh, interest for us because uh, it's a, it's the place where the Denisovans were discovered in a cave. The Denisovan cave is here in the Altai Mountains, and it's um, got a lot of other interesting points. Uh, I will be mentioning it uh, as we go along. Um, so let's see. So. Um, just a shout out to the step belt. Uh, some of you know I'm very interested in the history of the nomadic uh, horse people that uh, uh, came uh, into Europe with Genghis Khan and the Turkic mig migrations and all that. Um, this is the belt of grassland that uh, nourished all those animals to um, enable them to make their journey. So the, the step is a grassland uh, to the north of the, the desert, so you've got mountain, desert, and then grassland. Then you have what is called the taiga, which is the, um, the uh, forest, the boreal forest, uh, as, and then you've got the Arctic up here. So we're not going to find too many people in the Arctic, but we are going to find them uh, in northern and northeastern Asia, and of course, eventually going over to America. Um, uh, so, um, anyway, this is a map of where the early populations uh, migrated from and to. Uh, we start out with uh, early uh, people around 200,000. Th th these, these dates are uh, in the thousands of years. So KYA means thousands of years ago, A is ago. Um, so we're going back to 150 KYA or 200 KYA here um, and up to uh, the Holocene at present. And notice this uh, LGM here um, is the last glacial maximum. So what that means is that's when, you know, the, all, the whole period of the uh, Pleistocene during which um, our, our um, primate, our hominid uh, uh, types evolved is a series of, of ice ages, the coming and going of the ice. So at times it's farther north, at times it's farther south. So the latest or the last, the latest, now we've got global warming, so we'd like to have another one come back, I guess. Uh, but the latest um, glacial maximum was in this period you see in the, in the blue. So it isn't really over until you know, roughly 15,000 years ago. Uh, and that has implications for the migration, of course. Um, so I think I mentioned last time, some of these numbers have been revised <laughs> since this map was made. They found some earlier sapiens uh, in North Africa a little bit earlier than this, but let's take 200,000. The interesting thing here is that it's not until around 70,000 that you get a sustained migration. Now there are some earlier attempts, you know, say so you see 100 here up into um, Israel. But they didn't sustain that, but as of 70, you're gonna to start to get people coming out. 
And then we talked about the one going to Australia and New Guinea last time. Here we're going to talk about going into um, East Asia. And so 45,000 years ago is approximately our earliest um, record of these early hunter-gatherer uh, sapiens uh, in many different tribes. And we have a, a, some a genetic evidence uh, to, uh, to look at there. Um, so um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the theory of evolution because it it's really backs up everything that we're talking about here. And I thought I would start with Charles Darwin. Um, so this is a, a caricature of Darwin dating from uh, 1871, uh, showing him as an ape man. You know, of course, his theory was uh, not uh, generally uh, accepted. And there was a lot of opposition. A lot of uh, people didn't like it, um, both scientists and religious people. And, you know, there's a long story of how he um, resisted uh, publishing. You know, he sat on his data for about 20 years uh, because he knew it was going to create this uh, storm of uh, protest. Uh, but finally, he did in uh, 1869, 1859, sorry, uh, Origin of Species. And um, we call it the Origin or the Origin of Species, but his title was Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And natural selection really uh, should get the top billing here. Uh, because uh, evolution had been discussed, the, it was an accepted idea by many people, including his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. There's many people who had thought of that before, but nobody had figured out how it happened. You know, how did, how did species change? And Darwin was one of the first to figure that out. And, or the subtitle is Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. So it's, he's, he's calling it a struggle for life. And the ones that uh, have some trait that's uh, more advantageous uh, will uh, prevail. Now, the other person who's um, known for uh, the theory of evolution was uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who is one of my favorite characters in the history of science. Uh, unlike Darwin, he was an impoverished, um, student who, um, you know, uh, what's he going to do for a living? You know, he liked being a naturalist. And he came from a pretty good family. It wasn't, you know, uh, uh, impoverished until his generation. You're going, wait a minute, you guys spent all the money? Uh, so um, anyway, he, he became a collector and he went all over the world, uh, particularly to the Amazon and to Southeast Asia, uh, collecting and selling uh, biological specimens. So these are some of the animals that he discovered. He's reaching out here for a flying frog. Now, uh, of course, uh, the, the Victorians of uh, Europe were amazed that there was such a thing as a flying frog, um, but you can still see him over there in Borneo. Uh, here's a, a bird of paradise, the most amazing birds in the world. Uh, if you want to see some wonderful videos, do yourself a favor and just uh, go to a YouTube and look for Birds of Paradise. They're just uh, fabulous. Uh, orangutan, which was, of course, a big hit. You know, they, nobody knew about that before. And um, here's one of my favorites is the Rafflesia, the world's largest flower. Um, and uh, this one uh, I've seen on Borneo also. And um, it's not only the world's largest, it might be the world's smelliest. And uh, they had a fence around this thing. We couldn't get closer than about 20 feet away from it because they said, oh, no, you're not going to like going up closer. I said, well, I wanted to smell it. Uh, but anyway, it's a parasite. It, it, it attracts flies and all kinds of interesting things. So my point is, Russell Wallace was um, a wonderful collector. And, uh, you know, he, he um, his, his most famous book is uh, called the Malay Archipelago, the land of the orangutan and the bird of paradise, narrative of travel. Um, anyway, he's in the uh, Malay Archipelago, which is to say the island of Southeast Asia. And uh, bird of paradise here on the cover of uh, one of the editions. Um, the original title goes back to 1869. 
And uh, Wallace is a, it was the co-discoverer with Darwin of evolution. That's why I put him in here. If it weren't for uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, um, you know, would we uh, even had Darwin was so afraid to publish that, you know, he kept dithering and he had all the stuff and he, you know, he had sketches of his ideas and so on. But finally, uh, Wallace uh, was threatening to scoop him and get it first. And so he uh, hurriedly put it together. Darwin, uh, Wallace doesn't get enough credit. Um, Wallace we've met before also in the question of the, um, the Wallace line here, the blue is the Wallace line here in, uh, in the uh, Malay Archipelago in Southeast Asia. And so that's the line, if you recall, between uh, the Eurasian uh, province with, uh, it, it, with respect to mammals, things like dogs and bears and so on. And in, in the other side is the Australian uh, fauna with uh, kangaroos and stuff. New Guinea, they have tree kangaroos and possums and interesting stuff like that. So that's a, that's a big topic. But we're gonna come back to this area of the world because there's some very interesting uh, fossil humans uh, in that area. Um, and to just finally a little uh, uh, pitch for this book, uh, David Quam, and some of you may, may know him as a wonderful uh, naturalist and uh, a writer. Um, <clears throat> so his book on the Song of the Dodo recounts the story of uh, Alfred Russell Wallace in Southeast Asia and his discoveries and so on. And uh, he's a, quite a wonderful writer. So anyway, back to our, um, our fossil uh, background. Um, so I just put up here across the top, these are the various different types of uh, primates. Uh, people are in the, in the uh, order primates with the monkeys and apes. And our closest relatives here are chimpanzee first, actually two species, chimpanzees and bonobos, and then uh, gorillas and orangutans and gibbons. These are all uh, considered to be apes or arthrop arthropoids, anthropoids, sorry. Um, and then uh, more distantly related to the old world monkeys. So, so uh, we're definitely an old world uh, in the sense of uh, Africa and Eurasia. And then uh, the ones that uh, got to America, uh, New World monkeys, some of which have this prehensile tail. And the most distant ones are the uh, prosimians. And so we have tarsiers, lorises, and so on. Um, very interesting group, including uh, the lemurs of Madagascar. Um, so this is our, our family. And when you look at our uh, evolution, uh, this is looking at what we call hominins. And hominins uh, is sort of a subfamily of, of uh, primates. And I just call it people, not apes. So in other words, this is uh, the story of how our ancestors evolved when they made the break from other apes. So our ancestors were, were apes back here around six to eight million years ago. Uh, and they broke off and then uh, forged a, a separate uh, evolutionary uh, development. The first thing that we see is bipedalism. So the early ones are all bipedal. So they're walking on their hind legs. So this is a, a, a new development. Uh, they start to get smaller teeth. Um, they become hairless. So I think we mentioned this last time and uh, it has to do with adaptation to a savanna in East Africa where the sun's out a lot and you need to sweat to uh, cool down the body. So we don't know exactly when they became hairless. Uh, there's been some very interesting uh, approaches to try to figure that out because uh, hair, we don't get hair of the fossils, uh, but they, um, they're studying uh, lice, which I thought was a pretty clever thing, you know, to see if we can uh, figure that out through uh, studying the lice that uh, inhabited our ancestors. Uh, around two and a half million, this is where you get genus Homo. And we're talking, we're all genus Homo sapiens, uh, but we're going to take a look at some of our uh, close relatives, Erectus, which is the ancestor of all the later ones, and then Neanderthals. And uh, they don't have the Denisovans here. Uh, they hadn't been discovered. In fact, they're semi discovered because we don't really have much fossil evidence. So, you know, it's a. Mm, it's, it's there, but you know, what, what is it, uh, 
what does it mean? So uh, fossil evidence. So let's take a look. Um, in this chart, um, here we have the time. So today and million years ago, uh, back to seven million years ago. So here's our, the very early ones that we were pointing out, the first um, apes to become bipedal. Um, and then uh, various different ones. And, and you get up here to uh, genus Homo and see here's Homo sapiens. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out about this is that until very recently, we were not alone. Uh, we had relatives uh, out there in the natural world along with us. So most recently, the Neanderthals, uh, and this one from the Philippines, Homo luzonensis, um, and so on, and at earlier stages as well. You know, it wasn't uh, like today, we've managed to outcompete or kill off all the other ones that are threatening to inhabit our niche. Um, so we're gonna look most closely at, of course, at sapiens, which is really what we're after. But I, I wanna bring in the Neanderthals in particular because we all carry some uh, Neanderthal DNA and it's clear that our ancestors did mate at times with Neanderthals. Uh, so that's a big part of the story today. And then uh, we'll get into the Denisovans, which uh, like I say, they, they're, we don't have much fossil evidence so they didn't make it onto this chart. But here, let's take a look at uh, Homo erectus. Um, this is a particularly nice looking Homo erectus. Um, of course, this is, uh, nobody really knows exactly what they look like, but this is one of those reconstructions which was done by John Gertie. Some of you may have seen his work in National, National Geographic. And um, so it's quite um, interesting that he was able to do this. What he, what he does is he starts with a skull and we have lots of skull material for Homo erectus and he tries to get a representative one or maybe uh, add a little bit to, you know, all, these skulls don't all come uh, complete. But starting with the skull, then he, he, used, he uses strips of clay to lay down the, uh, the muscles and other flesh uh, on the, on the uh, skull to, to form a, a, a person's image and um, puts eyes in there and hair and so on. Uh, so it's a very, very educated guess uh, of how uh, a Homo erectus may have looked. So working from, from uh, fossil material. Um, so Homo erectus, uh, these are some of the uh, main sites. Um, I wanted to draw attention uh, down here to um, Indonesia. And this is the, um, the site of what we call Java Man. And Java Man, the reason I bring that up first is because they were discovered very early in the game. Um, they were discovered uh, in 1890 first, and, uh, and people were so impressed with it that, that for a while there, uh, it was thought that, uh, that maybe people uh, evolved in Asia because they found this very early material um, in, in Java and uh, in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, later in the 1920s, uh, people started finding um, what we used to call Peking Man, and um, I'm sort of struggling with whether to keep calling it Peking man because um, we're not supposed to say Peking anymore. Now it's Beijing. And secondly, we're not supposed to say man anymore because you know it's supposed to include women too. So I'm tempted to call it Beijing person. So, uh, but you know, the traditional name of this fossil is Peking man and you know, I'm kind of, stuck in my way, so I probably will call it Peking Man. Um, but we also have um, other sites. The, the very first one out of Africa is here in the country of Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains. And um, Audrey and I went there a few years ago and uh, they have a wonderful museum. If you, you get a chance to go to uh, Tbilisi, it's uh, well worth uh, seeing the museum. And we went out to the site and um, it's just remarkable that why would they go there? You know, and it isn't really a question of, well, okay, they came out from Africa and they went to Georgia. Well, they went out a lot of places and, you know, it's, 
you have to have really unusual conditions for, for these early remains to become fossilized. It, it's not like they're burying, they're not burying people. They just, if they're, if they're dead, uh, hopefully they're in a cave or something where uh, fossilization can occur. So I think it's mostly in a matter of an accident uh, of uh, history that we find them there. So you can see it's, it's hard. It's very sparse populations. It's, these are early hominids. They're, we don't even think that they had much in the way of language. We don't really know that. Uh, simple tools, uh, hand axes, and uh, you know, not a lot of um, cultural development. Uh, but they're uh, uh, adaptable enough to, to make it uh, all around um, the southern part of, of uh, Eurasia. And here's a, a little bit easier way to look at it. Dark green here is uh, uh, where Homo erectus was found. Uh, here's Old Dubai Gorge where the Leakeys worked for many years, Turkana, where their son worked. Um, here's the one in Georgia. And then over here, Zhogo Dian, this is a Peking man. Um, and let me just mention, we're gonna see another fossil, a, a Homo sapiens fossil from uh, quite close to Zhogo Dian. And um, the reason why they find them there is because the scientists live there and they go and look. And so the distribution of these fossils, a lot of times it depends on the development of the science in a particular country. So we have a, a lot of stuff in Europe. Uh, and then later we get in East, East Africa, but uh, in China for a long time, it's been very difficult to get access. And um, you know, there's less uh, archeology span archeology that's been done. Um, in Java, it was the Dutch colonials who had discovered uh, Java man. So uh, there's it's as much about the history of the, um, of the science as anything else. Uh, I really love this guy. This is another John Gertie portrait. This one is a Homo uh, heidelbergensis. And this is uh, considered to be intermediate between Erectus and Sapiens. And um, he looks like a kind of an interesting fellow. Uh, um, not sure if I'd want to be his friend exactly, but um, he, uh, you know, he's got quite a good look to him. Uh, is Gertie uh, having fun with these fossils? So I'll show you in a minute the, the, um, the, what the lines that we think connect these uh, different species. And uh, here's Neanderthal man. And um, if you're in the neighborhood, I do recommend uh, going to the Neanderthal Museum. Uh, it's near Dusseldorf, so it's, it's a big city. It's easy, easy to get there. And it's a, just a local train you can hop on and go to Neanderthal you know, Station. Um, and what they've done there is really kind of fun. Um, it's a lot of school kids go there, um, you know, it's a kind of puts them on the map to be the earliest place that these Neanderthal fossils were found um, or that were recognized, I really should say, because there later some fossils uh, were recognized as belonging to the same category. There's one in uh, Gibraltar, for example, was discovered earlier, but they didn't know what it was. So here's where they named it and they described it and say, hey, what is this? And for a long time, people didn't know what to make of it. Um, I don't think he wore a sport coat like that, but uh, the, the Germans were having fun with it. So um, here's just a little comparison between us and Neanderthals. Um, generally, they were sort of short and stocky compared to uh, modern humans. Um, and they have um, strong, sturdy bodies with, uh, and, and you can see a level of technology using these, um, spears with the hafted points on them. If you look at the skulls, um, this is Neanderthal on the right, and it's actually a bigger skull in terms of the uh, cranial capacity. You know, they measure the, the volume. What they do is pour sand in there and then pour it out into a beaker and measure it. And the Neanderthal uh, skull uh, has a higher average uh, cranial capacity than sapiens. It's a, I think it's about 100 cc's more. So 
Sabian's average is something like 1350 and Neanderthal's 1450 or something like that. So it's bigger. Does that mean that they were smarter? Well, they didn't compete well when, when they met up with sapiens, there was some interbreeding and then Neanderthals eventually died out. They died out in uh, Western Europe about 30,000 years ago. Uh, but they were around for a long time. I mean, the, the, the species we have, we have evidence of them from around 400,000 to 30,000. So they've been around longer than we have. Um, but uh, they do have this sort of sloping forehead and a lot's been made of that because this frontal area of the brain is sort of the executive uh, function of, of, of the brain. So we think that this is uh, really important that they, maybe they weren't, you know, were they not as smart? Well, you have to say, what do you mean by smart and um, what, and what kinds of things? What a lot of people think is that it had to do probably with two things. One would be language and the other would be uh, social organization because uh, sapiens prospers when they work well together. And the Neanderthals apparently were living in small groups, very separate from each other, and um, didn't have the, the uh, group uh, thing that uh, sapiens had. But there's lots of other things about it. Neanderthals have these big noses. Um, they have a uh, sort of a receding chin. Uh, one of the main features of sapiens is this uh, presence of a chin. Um, and then the nose, of course, um, this is European, so it's got, it does have a fairly prominent nose, and, but Neanderthal's got a beat on that score. Uh, so here's a, here's a uh, map of, of the major uh, Neanderthal sites. Here's Neanderthal itself. And notice that it's quite far north, and this is the, uh, the ice coming down during the Ice Age. So they, they, um, they lived, uh, you know, they, during times of uh, maximum glaciation, they had to migrate south. So, so this is a population that, that moved into what we call refugia. So Spain was a very important refugium for Neanderthals and, and their uh, predecessors. Um, and also the Middle East, uh, we see, we find some Neanderthals down here. So uh, they retreated from the ice during times of glaciation and then went back up uh, later. Whereas Sapiens were down in Africa. And so at the same time uh, that the Neanderthals are going north, some of them could come north because the climate uh, was, uh, you know, the, the, the habitat and so on changed the animals that they were hunting. So some of them were able to, so we'll see uh, sapiens uh, sites in uh, the Middle East as well. And that's, that's a really interesting topic uh, of how that happened. Now this is one of the um, earliest uh, skulls that we have of sapiens. Uh, this one's uh, from Morocco, uh, but uh, of course we got lots of uh, sapien sites uh, in the area that, that we're gonna be looking at. And um, here, this map, um, the sapiens are in this red color. So uh, we have sapiens here in Taiwan. We have them here in, um, in Vietnam, in uh, China, in Myanmar. And the earliest one apparently is this Nia Caves uh, in Borneo. So again, it has to do with preservation as much as anything else, why you find them uh, in a particular place. But just the uh, erectus is in blue. Uh, we, we talked about the erectus. And then uh, these two uh, oddball uh, species, uh, Floresiensis, which are the hobbits here uh, on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And then um, this one, uh, Luzonensis in, uh, in uh, the Philippines in the northern part of Luzon. Um, what I just want to say about this is with, with um, Alfred Russell Wallace pointing out that islands are really uh, a cradle for speciation because you get uh, animals migrating or sea level comes up and cuts them off or they're, they're on it in an island environment and then they evolve separately from, you know, as long as you're connected with the, the other ones, so you're going to have gene flow between them so they're not going to create two different species. But uh, in islands, you, uh, you often get uh, speciation. So islands are 
hugely interesting to study. And uh, uh, with, uh, with our topic, it's no exception. Um, there are also, people have been looking at here is, this is the uh, island of Sulawesi. And um, they found here on this uh, uh, south, southeastern uh, branch of it, uh, they have found artifacts, very ancient um, artifacts, but they haven't found the fossils yet, but probably, hopefully we'll find something there too. Preservation in the tropics is, uh, is a problem. So um, you don't get the same preservation that you get up in the Alt Altai Mountains or something. So um, wait, I wanted to go here and just pause for a minute and see if there's uh, questions. If anybody wanted, would like to bring anything up. Did you get any questions in the chat, Hillary? Uh, no, 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 not yet. But I have a question, it's sort of tangential, but it, you just reminded me of the time in the mid seventies when I was at Cal, there was uh -huh. this big controversy about um, Lucy and yeah. uh, Johansson, I think he came to give a talk and yeah. everybody got very excited, but I don't yeah. actually remember what the source of the dispute was, but he and the uh, professor White, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, got, had got into a, you know, an, a, some kind of dialogue about that. What, what was that all about? And does well, it have so, any relevance? Where do they, where does Lucy fit on your chart? Uh, so Lucy is, uh, is, um, the, is here, uh, Australopithecus afarensis. And uh, Lucy uh, is before the evolution of genus Homo. And at the time that Johansson found those fossils in the 1970s, you know, it's called Lucy after the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So you, it kind of dates the, uh, <laughs> the uh, fossils. But they found a lot more in Ethiopia since then. And um, it's in the Afar region of Ethiopia. So um, Johansson, um, I have to say, people get kind of over, uh, I mean, it, they look for so long, it's so hard. I mean, this is a desert, you know, they're out there in this desert day after day, and finally they find something. And naturally it's the best thing ever. And in the case of Lucy, it, it is pretty good. And, you know, if you go to our exhibit at the Cal Academy of Sciences, um, you know, Lucy's prominent there, um, partly because we had an Ethiopian uh, curator, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, she deserves it. Um, and what uh, Tim White is famous for uh, is, is uh, Artipithecus. And so he found these Artipithecus and not too far actually, uh, spatially from where, but quite a bit earlier. Um, Artipithecus is a very interesting fossil. Um, I think the most interesting thing about it is that it, it has a prehensile big toe. So it, you know that, that uh, cartoon of Darwin, he has these grasping uh, big toes so he can hold on to the branch with his, big, with his foot. Uh, I was kind of blown away when I saw that because it's, it's bipedal, but it's, it still grabs with its big toes. So, you know, that's the kind of thing we get excited about. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so John, Johansson, I think it was mostly a matter of, of um, you know, ego and uh, posturing and stuff like that. And Johansson, uh, he, he later went on to um, uh, University of uh, Arizona. He had this um, uh, institute, which was in Berkeley for a while. Um, but I could get into more about Tim White's uh, arguments with the anthropology department, but I, I don't want to use the time up for that. So um, anyway, that's a little bit about that. So anything else? Okay, well, no questions. Let's go on to the genetics. So genetics, of course, this is a really, really deep topic. <laughs> and, the, and our use for genetics is tracing ancient human lineages. And so I just want to talk first about mitochondria. So in the cell, uh, you have the nucleus of the cell, but then you have the cytoplasm, which is around the nucleus. And in the cytoplasm it are these little organelles called mitochondria. And they're extremely interesting. Uh, apparently, they have their own DNA. 
So you say, how can you have this thing inside of you, which has its own DNA? Why doesn't it have ours? Well, apparently it comes from something like a bacterium or something that was sort of captured way, way, way back and, and incorporated within the organism. And once you start looking for stuff like that, you find out that plants have chloroplasts, which probably have a similar origin. Uh, there's tons of stuff, you know, you think, you think you're just a person and you don't have any critters inside of you. Well, let me tell you, you've got a lot of critters in there and some of them are just in your microbiome, you know, when you're in your gut and stuff, but some of them are in your cells. And so these get passed down. Now, what, what's the, um, a few things about mitochondria, they're essential because they help the cell uh, create energy, this thing called ATP. Um, for our uses, the, the thing that's significant is that they're passed down from mother to child. So they go through the female line. And this is extremely important because if something goes through the nuclear DNA, it gets reshuffled and mixed because your DNA that you have in your nucleus or I have in my nucleus comes from mother and father. It's, it's a mix, right? And so before each of theirs is their mother and father. So it's a constant reshuffling of the cards as it gets passed down. So it's very hard to trace back through, through nuclear DNA. You can do other things with nuclear DNA, but tracing ancestry is best done with the mitochondria because they go through the female line, it's matrilineal. And as we'll see, uh, we have uh, on the male side, we have the Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome goes from father to son. So uh, we have a male counterpart and these have been very much used to trace uh, ancestry. So, um, and another point is that mitochondria evolve faster than the nuclear DNA does. Uh, they have a faster generation time. So, um, so what that means is that you can see change uh, quicker. Change happens more quickly so that you can, you can trace it. Um, so mitochondrial DNA are these relatively short, quite, quite short sequences of uh, DNA that are in the mitochondria, but we all have it and you can test anybody and find out and you can see what kind of um, mitochondrial DNA they have. So here's a little graphic, here's the grandmother and she passes it to her children, including the male side, but he can't pass it on. Uh, his wife is gonna pass hers on. Uh, and on the mother's side, now she can't, so she passes it uh, to her children. So um, that's the, the, the mode of descent. So this is a, uh, a DNA uh, lineage map, very simplified. But the idea here is, you know, these letters, what they stand for is what they call haplogroups that they've discovered that are markers for um, people's mitochondrial DNA. So the L uh, marker they find in all Africans. And then as people move out, uh, they find markers for the different regions that they migrate to, and they can create these sort of family trees. So in uh, the blue is Asia here. And so we have some coming out this way and some, it's very schematic, of course. I'll show you something that's a little more uh, precise, but this gives the, um, the overall impression that you have of the, of the passing down of these uh, haplogroup types in, in in the mitochondria. The other thing that's advantageous is because it's small, it's much less expensive to study. You know, uh, running the whole uh, nuclear DNA genome is, is a big deal. Nowadays, they've gotten the price down pretty much, but still. Um, so if we look a little more closely, um, here we see the transfer of these uh, haplogroups going, uh, out of Africa and up into Europe and over into Asia and, and they can trace them down into America and so on. And uh, the one we're gonna talk about a little bit later is this one that comes out of China and goes down into island Southeast Asia and over into Polynesia and actually a couple of uh, different lines going there. Um, and interestingly enough, this one going off to Madagascar, which uh, 
was a big surprise when they found that out. They thought Madagascar was going to be more close to uh, Africa. Um, so, um, so let's see. Okay, this is the this is just showing. Uh, here's the mitochondrial DNA going through the females, and here's the Y chromosome going through the males because. The definition of being male, one of the definitions, which of course that's a big source of debate these days, you know, <laughs> now we got people that are in between and whatnot, but um, is Y chromosome. So if you have a Y chromosome, you're a male according to this uh, interpretation. Um, so uh, so that, that, that raises the possibility of uh, having this um, mitochondrial uh, excuse me, Y chromosome atom, which I think is a really interesting idea. If you can trace back the father, grandfather, great grandfather, and so on, and you can, can you go back to some time when, you, when there was one uh, type of uh, Y chromosome that was passed down? And so uh, they have, this is a funny slide because it says the former atom or the atom or the fossil former, or not, it's not a fossil, it's a DNA sequence. But uh, the, this is the, the source of, 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 of the males uh, in our species. And it has this couple of lines. But uh, this was um, accepted, and you see 200,000 years ago, that's about the same age as the, going through the female line, and that was pretty well accepted. Um, but then uh, at, at some lab in South Carolina, um, they were testing um, Y chromosomes and there, there's this man named Albert Perry and um, he came up with a Y chromosome that was different from everybody else's. He didn't have, the, you know, so how, how did that happen? You know, so everybody was kind of freaked out. And so they said, well, let's look around and see if, if anybody else had that same Y chromosome. And they found in this, there's this tribe in Cameroon, West Africa, called the Mbo people. And some of the Mbo people, not all of them, but some of them, they went over there and they sent people over to, to, to get the blood and whatnot tested. And uh, they found that some of these Mbo people had this Y chromosome. So anyway, they've got this revised Adam now. Uh, and so he's uh, uh, back there, uh, 340,000. So, um, you know, uh, not too sure what to make of this. You know, is he really human or is he, you know, it seems to be human. Uh, so it, it's, this is such a fascinating field because stuff is happening. You know, it's, it's not like, it's not static. It's not like everything's been figured out. Um, so now if we look at the uh, nuclear DNA, so going away from these, uh, these others, here in the cell, in the nucleus of the cell, uh, we have the chromosomes, you know, and these are, you know, every species has a characteristic uh, number of chromosomes. We have 22 pairs, meaning one from each parent, 22 from the mother, 22 from the father, and plus the X and Y, which are the sex chromosomes. Um, so, but the chromosomes are made up of DNA. So this is, this is what uh, Watson and Crick discovered in the, in the early 1950s when they discovered the structure, the double helix. So this is what's called a double helix. And what it means is that the two strands are wound around each other. And they have these bases that are connected. So the structure of the double helix, it's held together by these A, T, C, and G, which are uh, uh, bases that are, that are uh, linking them up. And what a gene is, is, is a piece of this DNA. And it's a piece, it's, it's defined as a piece of the DNA that codes for a particular protein. The proteins, we think of proteins as the building blocks of the body. So um, let me go to the next one here. So here you see the, um, the, the information that's carried in the DNA. It's kind of like a, um, a manual for how to make a human. So the manual says, okay, I want you to make uh, this kind of a protein, or I want you to make this kind of a protein. And each cell knows which kind of protein it needs to make. So it reads the, the instruction that's pertinent. So it's kind of like if you got a, 
instruction manual for how to fix your car. It had it would have all the diagrams and everything of your car, but you're only going to look at the part that you're concerned with. Are you trying to fix the headlight or the clutch or what? So so each cell has its own little job to do, and it it reads that that part of the instruction manual, and it makes these uh, proteins. And then the proteins they could act alone, um, or they can act in complexes to form uh, different different cellular function. So um, and then there's the 22 pairs of chromosomes and the X and Y down here. Um, so when you look at what are the functions of this DNA, I'm not going to go into all this stuff about, you know, the, how the cell uh, works and so on. But I did want to highlight that, that there are markers in the DNA that reveal ancestral relationships. Um, and we talked about the Y chromosome, of course, is a chromosome and it's nuclear DNA. So that's one of them. Um, more interestingly, perhaps for our story is DNA can be extracted from fossils. Now, this is totally unexpected. I mean, you think, gosh, you know, this guy's been dead a long time. You would think that all this uh, organic material would have uh, decomposed, you know, uh, from a long time ago. But um, we now can get DNA from fossils up to 45,000 years ago in humans and Neanderthals, and they've got teeth for mammoths in Siberia of over a million. So under the right conditions, uh, this um, DNA may be preserved. And so there's certain bones that they look in the ear and so on in the skull and to preserve it better and so on. There's all these techniques, you know, clean room technique and all that. So it's quite, a, quite amazing that uh, the scientists have been able to do that. Um, uh, and then the genomes of different species have been constructed. So we have, you know, about the, um, the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project um, published a draft, their first sort of complete, semi-complete draft in 2003. It was a a long process. They had to develop new uh, machines to do it more quickly, and you know it's quite a quite a big ordeal. But that work was then uh, used uh, to get um, to be able to do it with other species. And as we're see, we're going to see, uh, Neanderthals also have been uh, sequenced. So we have the we have the genomes of, of people, of Neanderthals, and others. And of course, lots of animals have been studied that way. Um, so just a little bit of this is like chromosomes of a fruit fly. And um, what this is trying to show here is that uh, the, here's the color of the body, the tan bodies at this particular location. So the chromosome, you, they number the chromosomes and then the genes along the chromosome uh, are a particular location. So that location is where the gene for a tan body would be. Or not, so it's so that's the location to, to look for for that particular trait. Now I have to say that when they published the genome, they didn't publish what it means. They published the sequence, so they have the DNA, all the A, T, C, and G, and so on. They have it all laid out, but we over the years, it's going to take many many years to um, examine what does each gene do, you know? So, um, so that's the, the protein part. Um, so anyway, when we start to look at the whole human genome, we get the sequence here of the, of the, of the genes, and then we're looking for uh, the meaning. What are the proteins that that is uh, coding for? So, any questions about all that? Yeah, Audrey had a question. Yeah. Audrey, unmute yourself. Can you unmute her, uh, Hillary? I can just read the question. Yeah, OK. Um, do the lines on the chart of mitochondrial mutations represent movement from one geological area to another? Um, I 
I'm not sure what she's referring to. This is uh, that number 34. Number 34? Yeah. Right. So it does imply movement. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because people started in Africa and then they moved to Europe and they moved to Asia. So yeah, it, it does imply movement. And um, it, it, it doesn't per se tell you um, when they did it, but it does say that they did it. So, so it does imply movement. Yes, you're absolutely right. And then we have to try to figure out, you know, when did N evolve and did it evolved into R and then when did that happen and where and so on. There's more, a lot of questions, but you know, that's the story of science is the more uh, answers you get, the more questions you get. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I'm going to charge through this. Um, so I wanted to bring in uh, Svante Pavo, who's one of my heroes. Um, he's quite an interesting uh, person. He's of uh, um, Estonian ancestry, actually, as you can tell by those umlauts over his vowels. Uh, but his, uh, I guess he was raised in Sweden, so uh, he's Swedish, and um, he is uh, head of the team at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, uh, which deciphered the Neanderthal genome. And this was an incredibly uh, amazing occurrence because uh, he worked with a genetic material that they'd gotten from uh, bones in a cave in Croatia. And Croatia is not that far north, you know, so, but apparently the, the, the preservation was pretty good. They had three different uh, uh, extractions. I'm not sure if they were different individuals or just different bones, uh, but they uh, were able to get um, kind of short sequences of DNA. And um, what's interesting is if you have sort of a scaffold, in other words, you, you're comparing it to humans. So you know that the scaffold of the human DNA. And then you can match up pieces that, because they're 97 or 98% similar. They're very, very similar to humans, but they are very, there are differences. But so you can match them up. And when you match them all up, you can run them together and make a, a Neanderthal one. So it's, it's a patchwork, it's sort of like a mosaic kind of thing. Um, and then you can look at what's different about Neanderthals. And there's some very interesting things that are different. And um, one of the uh, suggestions is that the, being farther north, that the Neanderthals had already adapted to colder climates. And so perhaps, you know, some of the resistance to certain pathogens, for example, uh, or um, another thing is that the, the skin color, you know, because the Africans are going to be uh, dark because of the solar radiation, it protects against the solar radiation. But you get to be farther north and uh, dark is a disadvantage because you don't get as much vitamin D. So um, they, when they interbreed with Neanderthals, they pick up a little bit of light-skinned um, uh, DNA. So uh, in studying these, uh, these genomes, they're trying to figure that out. And it's quite, um, quite an interesting ongoing uh, process of uh, comparing those genomes. Um, so here's his team uh, uh, in uh, Leipzig, Germany. Um, uh, and then, of course, there were people in other labs. I mean, I don't mean to just say Svante Pablo did it all by himself. Um, and then here's some of the lessons from the Neanderthal genome. If, you know, you can come back and read this on the recording if you want to get more detail. But uh, so I said fragments can be isolated and studied from ancient fossils and then combined into a whole genome. Um, and they can be compared with other, with each other, with different locations, and with uh, with, with with sapiens. Um, and it, it does show that our ancestors occasionally made it. So Eurasians in general uh, have around two percent Neanderthal. And you know, if you get tested, and probably some of you got tested, usually the results are one and a half or two or two and a half. I've got two point eight, I think. I've I've got more than my share. Uh, but what's interesting is that it isn't the same 2%. You know, if, if you add up all the different uh, DNA of all the uh, Eurasians who, you know, got this, 
I've seen figures from 20 to 40% of the genome, of the Neanderthal genome is represented in modern humans. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting that the uh, Neanderthals are uh, very much with us. Um, now here's this cave in, in uh, Southern Siberia in, in Russia. Uh, this is in the Altai Mountains. And this is where, um, again, Svante Pava was, was, was uh, the main guy here. Um, this shows that the Neanderthals now uh, stretched, they found the Neanderthal genome here. And uh, so they were looking at these bones and the Russians uh, excavated this place uh, over many years. But in 2008, uh, they sent uh, a little piece of a finger bone to uh, Germany, to, to his lab over here in Leipzig. And they ran it through their, their genome sequencer and they discovered that it wasn't a Neanderthal, it was something new and different, it was a sister species. And they figure that it's closer to Neanderthals than it is to us, but sapiens have also interbred with these. And in Asia, you get these uh, Denisovan genes coming into uh, human genomes. And the, Neand and the Denisovans seem to be distributed uh, in Asia. And so it's kind of like um, the Neanderthals, and the, probably we would call it Heidelbergensis, I suppose, uh, split up and Neanderthals moved off this way and uh, Denisovans moved off this way or something like that. And they also found an example of a child which had a mix of Neanderthal and Denisovan genes. So they were interfertile between themselves and with humans. So it kind of begs the question of, are they really a different species? But people uh, cling to the idea that they're a different species because mostly they're a different species. <laughs> And we're all, you know, evolution doesn't create, you know, uh, hard and fast lines, you know, to, one blends off into the other. So that's a, that's a good lesson to remember. But what's surprising is the paucity of a fossil material. They had this little finger bone, then they had some teeth. This is a molar and, and it's a big, it's a very robust molar. So they had uh, maybe even more robust than the Neanderthals. They're pretty, pretty beefy molars. And later, uh, they went back, and this is a fossil that had been found before, but uh, they were able to figure out that they think that it's related to uh, the Denisovans also. This is a mandible from Tibet at over 3,000 meters altitude. So one of the things that uh, people may have gotten from uh, Denisovans is uh, the ability to uh, prosper at the high altitudes. This is something that people struggle with. I mean, you know, there are populations like Sherpas and stuff that, that do well at high altitudes, but a lot of us don't. So uh, that's a possibility. And um, so here, uh, this I thought was one of the more audacious uh, attempts. This is a, a portrait of a Denisovan, what, child, I guess. Um, based on DNA. Now, I got to tell you, this is uh, kind of out there, you know. It's not like we really can see in the DNA the features. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, uh, I just throw it out there to tell you that people are, are stretching the, the playing field here and trying to, to do it. But, but there are these attempts. So this one I want to just show you because this is a very interesting um, chart. Here we see Heidelbergensis and then Neanderthals coming off from them. They should be going up here into Europe too. And then the Denisovans meeting up here, but then coming down into Southeast Asia. And today the sapiens that have the most Denisovan genes are down here in what they call Melanesia, which is a uh, uh, the dark people of, uh, of New Guinea and neighboring islands and, and some in the Southeast Asia, but mostly down there. Um, so, uh, and over here you can see Erectus evolving into Heidelbergensis and then they evolve into Neanderthals and, and uh, Denisovans and then modern humans. So, um, and this goes into a little more detail. I don't really wanna get into that. Any questions? So we're going to get to sapiens here, uh, unbelievably. 
So here's our, our uh, skull from Borneo, the earliest modern human in Southeast Asia. So this is 35 or 45,000 uh, years ago or so. And uh, this is um, a lot of the other uh, sites. Here's the Borneo one, and here's one in the Philippines. And uh, this one uh, is very much talked about uh, in China. Uh, it's again, it's near Beijing, so uh, probably it's because it's an easy site to get to, the, you know, um, and so they've excavated that. Um, and they sequence the DNA uh, from these guys. And the overall picture of, of these early sapien sites is a lot of diversity, a lot of small tribes, um, and they're all hunter gatherers. You know, so it's relatively sparsely populated. And out of um, all that diversity, um, some of them go on to develop farming. Now, this one just shows different ancestral populations of uh, Paleo Siberians and North Siberians and so on like that. Uh, but when you get down into more, this is this is sort of proto-historic. This is like 10,000 years ago when, when uh, they're first starting farming and, and uh, writing is just around the corner. What you find is that farmers have such an advantage over the hunter-gatherers genetically. I mean, I mean, in the sense that you can have more kids, you know. Hunter-gatherers have a few kids. It's hard to keep their populations up. You know, they're wandering around looking for food, whereas the farmers have a source of food. And around the same time, uh, some tribes in northern China uh, domesticated millet, which is a, is a grain. And in, in the southern part of China, some other tribes developed rice. Now, these are two different populations, but the ones that developed millet went on to pretty much uh, expand and spread their genes, not only throughout China, but into Southeast Asia as well. Because once they found out about rice, and they, you know, this is, rice is, is there's a northern limit to where you can grow rice, but um, at least with their technology. But once they got that, uh, they were stronger and took over. And so uh, you get the modern, uh, Han Chinese and, and even, even counting Koreans and Japanese more distantly, um, these populations um, are quite genetically similar. Uh, so there is less, much less diversity in a hunter in a farming uh, genome than there is in hunter gatherers. The hunter gatherers had all different ones. Some of them went on to found populations in Siberia and Americas and so on. But the, the few tribes that emerged um, with the uh, ability to grow millet and then, of course, develop uh, large scale societies and armies and stuff, you know, they, they go on to, uh, to dominate and to, uh, and to take over uh, that whole area. So, but what happens to these people in, um, in southern China is that some of them go on to. Uh, be founders of a new population that goes into Southeast Asia. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But I just wanted to point out that we have some relics of the, uh, these ancient uh, hunter-gatherer populations. This is an Ainu family in Japan. Um, but we have little uh, relic populations in Negritos and Philippines up in the mountains. Um, India has some hill tribes. I mean, they're there's little uh, pockets of, uh, of people who uh, are descended from these earlier populations. So even though one population gets to jump on everybody else and spreads and spreads their, their genes, uh, these, some of them uh, are still there. But to get into uh, the Polynesian thing, um, this is showing um, them uh, going from uh, Taiwan. I'm gonna do something here to see if I can uh, yeah, so I'm going to pull this up a little bit. Um, around 3000 BC, 
some populations in Taiwan founded what we call Austronesian people. So these are descendants of the old South Chinese uh, genome. And, and they spread as they uh, developed their technology for sailing from island to island. Uh, and they come down through the Philippine Islands and then one branch goes to Borneo, another branch goes to Madagascar. And then they go down into this area in what we call Melanesia and ultimately to Polynesia. And you can see on this, if you wanna um, look at this more closely, the different number of years, this is 3000 BC. So that's 5,000 years ago, this whole thing starts and then uh, continues on and on. And um, uh, the, what's one interesting thing about it is that the, uh, the farthest that they go is uh, down here in the south is New Zealand. This is the, the last place that this is the Maori people of New Zealand. And they're settled from central uh, Polynesia, roughly the Cook Islands, down here about 1200 AD. So that's not that early. I mean, that's not so much before uh, the British got there, right? So uh, they'd been there and kind of spread and took over and had had their thing going when the, when the British came in in the 18th century. Um, but this, the other extremes of this are uh, Easter Island over here and Hawaii over here. So these are the last places to go uh, that they were able to, uh, able to, to, uh, to sail. And um, I, I wanna make a distinction here uh, between um, these different kinds of boats. So the key item is a, what we call an outrigger canoe. And this is just a simple little outrigger. Um, and here's, an, here's a picture that was uh, a drawing that was made in the, in the late uh, 1700s, um, I think on one of uh, Captain Cook's uh, voyages. And it shows these uh, people in the Sandwich Islands, they're going to a ceremony wearing their masks and they're paddling this uh, double hulled canoe. You know, they call them canoes, you know, it sounds like, how could you ever paddle across the ocean in a canoe, you know? Uh, well, this is not, this is for hot, sort of island hopping or going around the island, if you know the, the uh, prevailing tides and whatnot. But um, this is a, um, a replica of the uh, ocean going double hulled craft that the Polynesians made. And there's been a lot of this, you know, a lot of people are interested in sort of recreating these old technologies. How did they do it? And uh, this is called the Hokulea, and it actually sailed into um, San Francisco Bay back in the, in the uh, 90s. Um, here they are coming in. Uh, this is a fleet of these uh, double hull ships. Audrey and I actually paddled out in our kayaks to greet them. Um, couldn't keep up with them, but, um, but I just wanted to mention about these trade winds. And I think it's probably easier to see in this. Um, the trade winds in, in the tropics blow from east to west in the Pacific Ocean here. And it has to do with the rotation of the earth. So this is just a natural occurrence. Um, and uh, up here, as you can see, this is the North Pacific. The current comes down around California and it gets to the tropics and it goes east to west. So these people that came here, it, it was relatively easy easy for me to say, but uh, in the small boats to get island to island. So, so the spread among them was relatively straightforward. But getting upwind, you have to know how to tack. If you've ever been sailing, you have to go back and forth against the wind. But the virtue of that is if you can't figure out where you are, you turn around and you can go before the wind and the wind will take you back home again. Um, but getting across into, now see here in New, New Zealand's in the temperate zone. And so, you know, it's, it's different winds and, and they didn't know what, you know, it was like, that was totally crazy to go down there, but somebody figured it out in the same way with, with Hawaii, that uh, it's, it's not, uh, you have to get across the, you have to get across the uh, equator with the doldrums, they call it. And then you have to get up into the North Equatorial. So a bigger, much bigger challenge to do that. So uh, here they are uh, going out into Micronesia and Polynesia. 
Um, and it, it kind of um, brings up the question of, uh, did they ever go to South America? And I, uh, wait, I don't think this is all. I'm not sure this is, here. well, South America's over here. <laughs> you know, you, you think if they discovered all these islands, you know, they were, they were looking for stuff. And why wouldn't they keep uh, looking? So did they get to South America? And one of the big clues here is, um, is the sweet potato. So, so this is a potato that comes from South America and it was introduced to Polynesia around 1200 AD. And they can, you know, they can figure this out with the genetics. So how did that happen? And I think the most likely is that some Polynesians went all the way to South America. They found out the place was inhabited, you know, like it wasn't that great of an idea because you'd have to deal with all these, you know, feisty locals. And, but they stayed long enough to, uh, to figure, to find out about some um, crops that they could grow, which uh, potatoes and then um, bottle gourd was another one. Um, and so the alternative explanation is that these sweet potatoes just sort of floated over there. And you know, there's a lot of dispersal that happens, but I don't know, I kind of like the idea that the Polynesians went there. We can't exactly prove it, but it is uh, kind of fascinating. So I just wanted to end with a, a few pictures of uh, Maori, some one of my favorite uh, groups there. Uh, uh, pretty feisty folks there in uh, New Zealand. And uh, this one is uh, sporting the traditional tattoos. You know, nowadays they use the, the uh, modern method of tattooing, which just kind of injects a little ink under the skin, which is relatively mild uh, tattooing. Here's a picture from the 18th century of a, of a Polynesian uh, with his very elaborate tattoos. In many cultures, it was a, um, it was a mark of uh, royalty or of uh, status to have, have these tattoos. And uh, look at the tattoos on this guy. Some, some books, call it facial carving. They actually, you know, they had this little uh, blade that they tap, 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 and they would make a groove and then they'd rub in the, the pigment. But people were very um, proud of their tattoos. And then finally, uh, you probably recognize the haka. This is the, uh, the defiant, the defiant uh, dance that the Maoris do when they, now they do it in soccer games and uh, rugby games and stuff. But in the old days, they'd go out when they would go out to face their enemies. They'd uh, they do this incredible uh, display, you know, of how fierce they were. And uh, these guys actually look relatively benign. A lot of them would stick out their tongues and shout, and you know, so on. So that's kind of fun. So anyway, um, that's it. Uh, thank you for participating, and uh, we could have questions. Any questions from anyone? If not, I, I would like to ask you, Roger. Okay. What are the promising new technologies out there that might advance this science even further? Well, I think all the uh, action right now, or most of it, is in the um, is in the genetics. You know, uh, when I first started studying it, it was we called it stones and bones, and it was it was uh, fossils and artifacts. And I haven't done much with the artifacts in this talk, but um, that there's a lot there. And uh, a lot of the uh, development in that part um, has to do with uh, dating techniques. You know, how do you know how old stuff is? And of course, the discoveries of the uh, radioactive uh, dating techniques is uh, uh, well known. Um, uh, again, in, after World War II, you have the uh, carbon-14, for example, and then potassium argon and different uh, dating techniques. And there's been quite a few, there's been a lot of development there. And uh, that's quite an interesting thing because you can get a better idea of how old things are in, in sequence, you know, like which happened first and second. But in the, in the case of the genetics, um, I have to say the, the one that I find really interesting is, you know, I, you mentioned, I mentioned, um, that the DNA, what, what it does it functionally is it, it's the code for making proteins. 
And so our body's made up of proteins and we've got all these proteins acting together. Um, so what if you don't have the DNA, could you figure, uh, figure anything out from the proteins? And there are some cases where they've um, sort of reverse engineered the DNA. In other words, if you can sequence the protein, the protein is made up of a sequence of amino acids. And so if you can study the protein and then you can reverse engineer the DNA, maybe you can get some of the same information that way. And there have been some cases that, that one uh, that um, Mandible from uh, Tibet is a case of that where, where they, they didn't get, it, it wasn't good enough preservation for protein, but the, you know, teeth are very, very hard. And so they preserve a lot of information uh, about uh, old populations. So I guess I would say that, and then uh, continuing to figure out exactly what does each gene do? You know, how does it, how does it, what is it the code for? What protein? And, um, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, stuff that needs to be figured out about that. So those are some, some ideas of, of uh, future possible developments. All right, I have one more question if I may. Sure. <clears throat> um, the, how much sharing is really done between nations? You mentioned the Russian sharings and Oh. You know, uh, yeah. artifacts. Is, is, is some of it really kept secret or that, that, that the Russians or the, some other competing country might not share with it in this community? Well, I think there's some of that. And I would, uh, I would say uh, to be more, um, is, it, is it purposeful? I mean, is somebody trying to hide stuff or something like that? And I would say, certainly there are sort of nationalistic agendas, you know, so the Chinese want to show that, you know, their people did something earlier or whatever, stuff like that. So that kind of stuff happens. Um, I would say the bigger problem um, was during the communist period, um, the Soviet Union was really uh, out of bounds for Western scientists. And so uh, the, they control a huge amount of area there. And um, so a lot of that was opaque to Western science. Um, in the case of the Chinese, I, I would say the Chinese got bigger fish to fry. I mean, you know, there's, this stuff is not gonna pay the rent. You know, this is, uh, this is kind of a luxury. Um, so they haven't done as much, although they've done some, and they do definitely, there's a lot of papers that I uh, looked at from China, you know, they do do some, but it, it's, it's uh, not as much. But the other one that I think is really, um, has a, a lot of potential is, you know, Westerners, now that uh, Russia, Russian scientists are uh, allowed to, to um, interact with Western scientists and they want to, um, we need to learn more about uh, what they've found. And, um, you know, I've only uh, nibbled away at the edges of this, you know, with a few things that I've done, but there's a huge body of material that's in Russian that's about Siberia, about Central Asia, about, you know, and it's, it's various different things. It's ethnography and it's uh, this kind of uh, paleoanthropology and stuff. And it's relatively little known in the West. Uh, and I would say it's uh, a language barrier among other things. So there's all this stuff that was developed over, you know, what was the Soviet Union was there from what, 1917 to 91 or whatever. And it's a long time and they, their scientists did do a lot of stuff. So I think there's, um, there's a, a, a long way to go on that score. And uh, I, wouldn't, I would treat it uh, more charitably than just say people are hiding stuff. Um, you know, it's, it, it's various, various motivations, but you know, uh, you know, you just, um, I guess what you have to depend on is, is the um, sort of the fraternity of scientists. I mean, um, one of just one footnote about Svante Pabo that I thought was really interesting. You know, a lot of this stuff is kind of, um, when it comes to Germany, uh, it's a little bit suspect, you know, because the Germans had uh, racist theories, right, when under the Nazis. 
And so when, when the, uh, the German government created the Max Planck Institutes, and they have one that's for, for, um, for paleoanthropology for this subject, um, they purposely went out and recruited scientists from other countries, like Svante Pavo from Sweden because uh, they recognized that uh, German scientists, science, well, German science in general had a little bit of an odor to it. You know, they, like they had to overcome uh, their bad history. And, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you have a country that's, that's, on the one hand, they've got really good science. And on the other hand, they got really bad politics there for a while with the Nazis, right? So. Um, I thought it was so interesting that they, they saw that and they said, okay, we want to have this institute that's going to be world-class and we want to populate it with scientists from other countries and they were going to pay for it. That I thought was truly remarkable. So, you know, nationalism does come into science, no question about it. And uh, we have one more question from Audrey. Uh, I see your mic is on, Audrey. Would you, would you like to just directly ask it? Well, I, I said, um, can you explain the recent determination of protein structure from just its sequence of amino acids and knowing the structure of proteins with similar sequences mm -hmm. of amino acids whose structures are known? Yeah. I think the problem there, I mean, you probably know more about this than I do, but I know that the, that it's more than one amino acid uh, sequence can make a, a protein because, um, you know, the codes, you know, the codes are, when you look at the genetic code, a particular amino acid can be made by uh, different sequences of uh, bases, right? Your, your three base uh, uh, sequence. So I don't think that there's, it's not a direct, there has to be some way to, um, to figure out which one it was, but I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on that? Do I have a what? A thought about how you could go from a protein to, an, a, to a gene? It's, it's reverse engineering is what it is. Well, yeah, I mean, each, each, um, each segment of the messenger RNA corresponds to a particular amino acid. Right. And vice versa, if the amino acid, you know what the amino acid is, and you should be able to figure out what the messenger RNA is. Right. And and if you if you know that one segment of a protein has that shape, that sequence, and you know from um, X-ray crystallography or whatever that that's a a, a helix. Mm -hmm. a, a rick rack of you know structural rick rack thing then they i think they take um the sequences from a lot of proteins that have those shapes and they put mm -hmm. them all together in a computer and figure out what would be the shape for mm -hmm. the new protein yeah yeah i mean yeah we have to stress that all this stuff would not happen without computers. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're talking about a genome that's roughly 3 billion base pairs long, right? So nobody's going to be able to keep that in his filing cabinet and go take a look at it. Um, you know, you have to have these, and, and then the population genetics with all the mixing and stuff, it's this hugely complex uh, subject. Uh, but they've got uh, a whole field of, uh, you know, quantifying and, and sort of uh, mapping and uh, figuring out, you know, how uh, genomes work. And it's, you know, I, I can barely scratch the surface of it. And I'm kind of glad that I don't have to because it's, <laughs> it's, in, it's deep. But, um, you know, people who understand it and they get into it, it's, uh, I, I'm, you know, you say, uh, well, you seem to use a computer pretty well. Yeah, but I don't know what the hell's going on inside there. You know, I mean, we all uh, work with all this stuff that, you know, we depend on uh, other people to uh, figure out uh, how this whole thing works. You know, so all I can do is report, here's some of the things they found out and what we think, you know, 
uh, happened in the past. But it's pretty remarkable that, you know, this is a period of time when there's no written records. You know, we don't even know how much they were able to talk. Uh, and so uh, it's, it just uh, blows me away that, that we know as much as we do. Uh, and another 20 years or something, it's going to be another revolution. So uh, anyway, I'm quite, a, quite in awe of this field. And I think it's uh, really interesting. So anyway, I just wanted to say um, in a future talk, I do want to get into the linguistics part, which is a lot of fun. And uh, that'll come bring us closer to history. This is a really way back there. And I, I felt that I had to go back uh, to the old uh, fossils because um, of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. You know, where the heck did they come from? You know, you can't just have people waltzing out of Africa. Oh, there's uh, Neanderthals. Okay, well, who the hell are they? Where did they come from? So I wanted to try to, you know, give you the background there to see um, what that all means and, and how that happened. So. Thank you for sticking with me this far. <laughs> it's a fascinating uh, subject. Well, Roger, thank you very much. We, we really do look forward to that. Could you turn off your share screen, Roger? Oh, sure. Uh, we're looking forward to the presentation on languages, certainly. Let me just give a quick commercial of what's coming up next. We have a retired uh, cardiologist that's gonna to talk to us about how the heart works and about heart problems. And he'll be speaking to us on, on the second Wednesday of October, that is the 13th. So please join us for that. And uh, we also have coming up in November, a volcanologist who specializes in worrying about what happens when if a volcano could erupt near one of our nuclear storage facilities. Mm. And he's going to give us a talk on that. So we have uh, two, equally, two equally interesting topics coming up to match Rogers today. So I wanna thank you all for coming past the word. Uh, I'm starting to run out of people I can draft. <laughs> so yeah. uh, all Let's recommendations are welcome. So. Thank you, Joe, for all the work you do to get these uh, put together. That's because Audra gave me the most detailed list of instructions <laughs> on how to do this. Oh, that's great. Okay, so thank you all for coming. I'm going to stop the recording now. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Right. Okay, bye-bye. you, everyone else. No, no, I'll, yes, Jeff, something, Audrey. Did you have another point, Audrey? You just want to say thanks. I think she was just saying,